Welcome to Drive-In Double Feature. I'm Ryan. I'm Nathan. And this is the podcast where we talk about two movies every week, every Tuesday and Thursday. And today, Nathan, we're going to be talking about The Phoenix City Story from 1955, directed by Phil Carlson. And I think this is one of the first, besides maybe Wired, that's based off of a true story that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, and I'm always I'm always excited for that. It's actually our first. Um, it's kind of a pseudo documentary, like you know, it's part docudrama, so it's first one in that field too. Yeah, I mean, because yeah. the movie starts right away with interviewing the real life subjects that are in this movie, that like were the real people that were involved with the events that happened in this movie. And at first, it's just kind of like. Because I, when I started it, I was like, what? what is this? And I'm like, at first I thought I picked the wrong movie, to be completely honest. I'm like, did I, <laughs> did I accidentally pick a documentary? Mm-hmm. And, but, you know, after about 15 minutes, they basically they interview um, the guy and this, the main guy's wife. They interview uh, other people that were involved with this event. Basically what happens is there's a lot of, the Phoenix City is a real seedy town. It's, there's a lot of gambling, prostitution, um, drugs, that type of thing in town. And it's like this big crime syndicate that basically runs the whole town. And one group of people tries to basically put a stop to it. And because of that, um, a very prominent figure um, gets murdered in the process. And that's just kind of like all the events leading up to that point is basically our movie. Yeah, yeah, and like you said, where it's based off a true story, and I guess it was made, like, right as that became a big hit. I read a little fact that it was filmed while people were still on trial for everything that went down, um, which I find very interesting that for 1955, they were able to get the ball rolling that fast. Yeah, it's 1955. Um, the man that was murdered was Albert Patterson, who was a uh, actually won the primary, the Democratic primary, to become the Attorney General of Alabama. And he was just kind of like one of those people that was vowing to take out all crime. And because of that, he was assassinated before the election even happened. Yeah, because that's the big theme of this movie, I feel like, is uh, corruption, not only like in like small town America, but like corruption in the government. Like, yeah, it really, it really pushes that message. I think really strongly. Um, you know what movies? Have you ever seen all the King's Men from yes, the fifties with, uh, with Robert Ca- Crawford? Yes, that reminded me heavily, or this reminded me heavily of that movie. It also reminds me of On the Waterfront, which came out around the same time. I was definitely getting on the waterfront vibes where it's just mm-hmm. kind of like, so, I, I mean, at the beginning of the movie, Albert Patterson is kind of, he's very neutral. He's basically just this lawyer who's had a very long career. And by the time all this stuff is coming to a head, like even the crime boss, it even comes over to Albert Patterson and basically just like, you're not going to do anything. Are you? He's like, I'm not picking your side. I'm not picking their side to go against you leave me alone type of thing yeah um it's it's honestly a little interesting because it makes you at least for me i kind of like this crime boss at first you know he was kind of cool he's kind of suave he's he's not overly mean to him you know he's very like you're neutral all right that's fine he does walk out the door and craps on somebody about to walk into the office but there's something that they played with this character to make him a little likable but of course, in the end, you, you hate the guy for all the actions that happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they when you you kind of see like these how they operate. I mean, they base they they say right away how crooked these people are. Like these the gambling machines are basically only you're you're only going to win a penny for every dollar that you put in. Um, mm-hmm. You get uh, like the dice are loaded at the casino, and they uh, the cards are marked so that way all the dealers could basically never lose so yeah um and it's definitely like and it it does set that up in the documentary part of the movie and let me tell you i really like this part of the movie the very beginning with the guy interviewing people the real people because it it felt very i guess guess the words are raw because it felt like first take material people are stuttering people are like 
thinking about what to say. Because, you know, normally in documentaries, they do multiple takes for stuff like that to get a better read. This didn't feel like that. This felt like the real thing. Like he was actually asking real people, like, hey, what what happened? Yeah, and, you know, that kind of, that's kind of like a, we could go off a little bit on that. Because uh, when I watch documentaries now, they're so sensationalized. It's like you're watching... It's it's a very clear, heavy bias type of thing where it's like, okay, we got to push our agenda. I mean, what? I mean, however you feel about it, it's very heavily skewed on one side. And like you said, everybody speaks really super clearly. They all have their thoughts together. They get these nice little sound bites in these documentaries. But in this one, like you said, I think because I've seen other older documentaries from the '50s before and like you said it's very it's very real it feels real it feels like they're real people they don't there's no frill frills in it it's just kind of like these are the facts we're going to interview these people and whatever the first thing comes out of their mouth that's what we're going to put in this movie yeah yeah i mean documentaries back then were way different than they were now like usually they were like interviews and fly on the wall stuff like the camera was set down and we're just going to watch what people do i mean obviously this is interviews but it definitely feels more organic, less theatrical, which exactly what you said. And there's something I can appreciate about that. Um, now, can I say the same for the movie? No, this movie does fake a little bit of the plot points and stuff, but I think it makes for a really great movie. I, I have, This movie is really cool. It was a really neat little movie. I, I really like this one a yeah. lot because it is – exactly what i want from a film noir it's very dirty it's very grimy i mean everybody is just tensions are very high throughout the whole movie and you really don't know what's going to happen and because like i said it's just these people living in this town that's filled with corruption albert patterson's son john patterson comes into town after being out at you know in the army for a while and he's he's kind of wants his dad to kind of take a stand and he's willing to put his neck out there and go against this crime syndicate and because of that a lot of terrible things happen to him and other townspeople and i think we should go ahead and talk about it because i want to talk about this scene right away is yeah. he uh he goes into the casino and he tries to break up this fight and basically because basically like these other people had gotten into a big fight and beaten within like an inch of their life. And so he goes to the casino and tries to get a little bit of revenge. And because of that, what the, uh, one of the black people that worked there, his name is Zeke helps him out. And because of that, the, uh, crime syndicates goons goes out and they find, uh, this guy's daughter and she's out just skipping. Like it looks really, so happy she looks so happy and then all of a sudden she's like, are you zeke ward's kid or and she's just she lets out like this blood curling scream and then he picks her up mm-hmm. and then the next scene you see them throwing this little black girl into the driveway of john patterson's house and she is a bloody mess yeah. and with a note that says if you don't stop this will be your kids next yeah it, it really like took me back because it was so violent to see for 1955 like this girl's like dead lifeless on the lawn but it's more violent than some things i've seen just because it's such stark imagery what kind of sucks is this didn't actually happen in real life this didn't happen it was kind of sensationalized and i'm i'm not too sure why they put this in I don't know either and I I think a lot of this stuff was kind of embellished mm-hmm. um, so I'm not entirely sure but, but it makes for it a good definitely scene. <laughs> for dramatic purposes wise it's actually really good though I mean <laughs> yeah. it's I mean I can't get it out of my head this horrible image and yeah. I mean even by today's standards it's still very shocking to see mm-hmm. yeah I couldn't even imagine for audiences then and and I think that's what really stands out about this movie is it definitely feels ahead of its time as far as, like, violence and griminess goes. Like, this is very grimy. Like, it's the whole the whole thing just has, like, this dirty tone to it. Like, there's a giant fight that breaks out, and the cops are just kind of, like, 
eh, they're not hurting each other, and they kind of just stand there and watch people beat the crap out of each other. It's yeah, yeah. yeah I, I mean, that's that's very clear that this crime syndicate has the cops under under their thumb, city officials under their thumb, and there's even like one guy that's like a mole for them. Yeah. That's even with even with the good guys basically that calling up, make, telling them their every move, but. Even when that little girl does die, they call up the police and they're just like, you send the cop car over here right now. There's a dead girl in our driveway. And the guy's just so nonchalant about it. He's like, oh, there's a dead kid in the driveway. And somebody <laughs> needs to go look on it. And like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which also could play into maybe race relations in 1950s Alabama as well. Well, uh, I didn't say it, but yeah, he does use a racial slur about this little girl. So yes, yeah, he does. Um, I, I guess something that they kind of, you know, kind of don't talk about in this is that a lot of people involved in this who would later go run for government ended up being racist with ties to the KKK. And this movie does not does not really go into that for for good reason, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it goes in the opposite direction because John Patterson, like I said, he. Mm-hmm. So I mean, we're getting ahead. I mean, like the so Albert Patterson, he he did win the nomination. And after he gets assassinated, his son, John Patterson, takes over that nomination mm-hmm. and he becomes the attorney general of Alabama, which leads to him becoming the governor of Alabama. Yes. And and. This time, so there was a pretty significant event that everyone has heard of where um, Rosa Parks sitting on the bus, which kind of sparked this big um, civil rights discourse of just, you know, people of every race trying to fight for their own rights. And because of this, there was talking about desegregating schools and things like that. And it's really funny because George Wallace ran against John Patterson during his election and George Wallace was seen as like a racial moderate, even though he has a very, <laughs> he has a very infamous history of fighting segregate, you know, making fighting desegregation and keeping schools segregated. But John Patterson was like one of the very first ones that that would say he would make really uh, emphatic statements saying that any school that has to be integrated will be shut down immediately. Holy crap. And in fact, he did a lot of other messed up stuff. Like he got the NAACP kicked out of Alabama. He basically was basically because that was like the whole deal is that he would try to use race relations because race relations was a really hot issue at that point. And a lot of other candidates weren't talking about it. And because he was like one of the first ones that said, making a very, really, uh, like, you know, a statement saying, you know, all, you know, keep all the black people out of Alabama, like keep it segregated and that type of thing. And because of that, he ended up winning the election for governorship. And like you said, he got a full endorsement by the KKA, KKK. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's where the question lies with this movie that I, I thought about while watching it. So it's obviously a good, well-made movie. Like it's a, it's like a really solid movie and do you take this and we watch it as just a movie? And do you think it actually does better because it changes history? It makes this character a more inspirational one that is, you know, he's anti-racist. He actually, a black man in the end of the movie saves him. Or do you think it does more negative where people would look at this person and think, oh, this guy was a great guy, which really he wasn't in real life. It's, it's weird. Well, so that's the, pretty much the whole reason how this guy won the election. So yeah. <laughs> they, I, I, like I said, I watched a documentary about John Patterson right after I watched the movie, and there were they interviewed journalists from that time that worked for like the Alabama Informer and that type of thing, um, and they would. That's pretty much they were saying like it was his election to lose. I mean, they said the only way. John Patterson would have lost that election as if somebody's mother was gunned down instead of their father. Mm-hmm. And this movie came out. It was a big hit. They, it premiered in Phoenix city where all these murders happen. And uh, like I said, he, he won all, 
in a lot of people's minds after this movie came out. Like this was like I guess for modern purposes of watching at least go in knowing that these people aren't really inspirations but as a movie if you think of it in terms of like just how it's made how it's acted plotting it's a really cool movie like it's a really I, I, together one right i mean yeah. you kind of have to really look at it as is it a good movie or not because mm-hmm. i i mean you know if somebody doesn't want to watch this because it doesn't align with their views or whatever i mean i can get that they don't want to support you know uh making this person to a heroic figure type of person but at the same time you know i like the movie it it works because there's a lot of movies like biopics where the the subject is not a very good person behind closed doors or like outside the movie like uh who is it john nash from a beautiful mind Oh, supposedly yeah. like a huge anti-Semite. I just hated Jewish people so much and yeah. had no problem telling his, expressing his opinions about it. But <laughs> yeah. And Ron Howard was like, cut that out of his story. <laughs> yeah. It's like, maybe leave that one out. <laughs> and, but uh, that, so, I mean, that's, I was just saying that to prove a point that there's a lot of people that, yeah, uh, that should not be idolized. And that's, that's, I mean, that's just kind of like my motto. I kind of take it for what it is in this movie. I judge it as a movie, not as a, is this movie accurate? Because most biopics are not very accurate yeah. and don't align. But I will say, though, like I said, it was a really great movie. I mean, it was, I, was, I, I, I liked it a lot. It was really well acted. Uh, the ending was really good. The music I, I really enjoyed, too. It's, it, just, it worked on a lot of levels for me. Yeah, no, I, I, think, it's a, I think it's a cool movie. Like, uh, it... I, I liked its mood. I, I really liked some of the performances in this. I actually really liked the, um, um, the, the, uh, God, what's his name? Uh, the older guy, the, the, the one who gets shot. Oh, Albert Patterson. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Al, Albert Patterson. I really liked his performance. I like his slow change to the movie when he finally decides, all right, I'm not going to take this anymore. We're going to take him down. He, he's a really cool figure. Uh, so, I, yeah, that was he was actually my favorite part of the movie. I thought he was actually really good. He reminded me a lot of uh, like Gregory Peck's role in To Kill a Mockingbird. He had like that yeah. kind of energy to it, which this predates To Kill a Mockingbird. So, but it it reminded me a lot of that. Um, yeah, yeah, it, no, for sure. But I was gonna say, so did you happen to look about like the actual real life events of this assassination and who they ended up indicting? No, I just know at the time when they were filming this, they didn't even know who did the killing. But who who did they end up indicting? So uh, the, the, there's three individuals that were indicted in this. And mm-hmm. I guess these were kind of people that had the – they were either running the crime syndicate or that they had it under their nose. I didn't do a, a ton of research, but the, the limited research I did. So the three people that were uh, indicted in this was – one, the current attorney general of Alabama during the <laughs> during the events. Oh my god! Because uh, supposedly he at the time was being indicted for voter fraud uh, once because he was running against Albert Patterson, and and then I guess he maybe ordered this hit. Um, they don't know, but his name um, he actually ended up fleeing. Alabama and actually spending time in a mental institution for nine years after oh these my events. God. And John Patterson said, yep, never got him, never did, you know, never, he was never prosecuted. He never went through the full prosecution of this. Gotcha. Uh, another person was uh, the current district attorney during that time, uh, Arch Farrell. Okay. Yeah. So it was also... Yeah, well, also was not a big fan. And then the other person who ended up uh, being convicted, he got away with it. He basically didn't have enough evidence. They didn't have a smoking gun on this man. Mm-hmm. But the one person that was convicted was Deputy Sheriff Albert Fuller. And so, okay. I mean, and he spent 10 years in prison for shooting, <laughs> shooting a political candidate. Wow, holy crap. <laughs> wow, what a turn of events. Uh, Just, I mean... Because you, because in the movie, like you, like we said, it's like this big crime boss guy. He's like, oh, I'm a, you know, like a under, you know, like a big mob 
big shot type of guy. Mm -hmm. And then the actual three people that did it are, are the people that are running the whole entire state. Yeah, which is so weird because this movie definitely has an angle of like the way to fight corruption is through democracy, right? Like through democracy, we're going to fight corruption and then come to find out the three that get indicted are just a part of the system. <laughs> Interesting. That's, yeah. Yeah. Usually the problems are with them. Uh, yeah, exactly. Now, as, that's that's what's so interesting about this movie, where it was made in such a timely matter that, like, they didn't even know all the facts going into it. I, that is crazy. I mean, can you imagine, like, they just make a movie about a murder, and then they don't, like, well, we don't know who did it. Like, it, it, it's that quick. They're like, we, we, yeah. we made it so fast that we don't have all the details of said yeah. murder. Yeah, like, we're, like, we have, like, murder move or move, murder docu-series now that's, like, 20 years in the making. This is, like, a couple months in the making. <laughs> Which, yeah, I know. Can you imagine, like, this is, like, one of those shows that you see on Netflix. It's, like, a mini-series. It's, like, 10, 10 hour-long uh, hour long yeah. episodes. That seems like right up Netflix's alley. It's like, oh, yeah. really cheap content. We could do this. Yep, yep. And then they just use clips from the Phoenix, the Phoenix City story. <laughs> Probably. Uh, yeah. John Patterson, like I said, he he comes off really well in this movie. He's the hero of this whole story. And he he said the one criticism that he said, and you can tell what a modest guy he is, he said the movie underplayed his role, even though he is like oh my God. as big of a... <laughs> As big of a hero as you can possibly yeah. get in a movie. He literally stands in the front of the casino where this is crime Bob, like, does his business. And he's like, if you want to take it, it's here. This is where all the corruption is. He's he's such a huge figure. You got to be kidding me. Yeah. It, which is really funny. And then, uh, but like I said, a lot of the journalists that they did interview about the movie afterwards all these years later they basically said it's like yeah there's a lot more fiction than there is fact in that yeah. movie which like it like we said it's just that's just kind of how it, it normally is in these types of movies exactly uh, um uh, but yeah uh that so john patterson he actually just died last oh, year really oh wow yeah almost 100 years old holy crap just missed wow. his hundredth birthday and uh since then um Back in 2008, he actually supported Barack Obama when he oh. during his presidential bid, and he even came out to say he regretted how he ran his campaign back in the day. So oh, that's, good. that's good. He realized the error of his ways. Now, maybe did he cause a lot more harm than good? Does it make up for all the maybe racial tensions that were probably building in Alabama at that time? Who knows? Yeah, I'm not here knows? to make any judgments, <laughs> but I'm just saying this that you know there was a lot. Of, stuff going on during that time but yeah. uh like I, I i urge you if you do if this does interest you there's a lot of really crazy stories i was telling nathan some other really crazy ones that don't necessarily pertain to what we were talking about but it's there's a lot a lot more crazier stuff going on behind the scenes yeah i i think that's what's so cool about this movie is it does give a conversation about something that was really that crazy you know it's such a wild story with so many turns so many things going on and this movie shines some light on it i never knew any of these events until this movie so hey i think that's pretty cool i didn't either but i had a lot of fun researching it and reading about it and falling down that rabbit hole so yeah but i think that's it i give it a really high recommend definitely check this one out oh yeah check, check this one out it's a it's a really it's it's a cool movie especially if you like 50s gritty noir give it a shot Absolutely. But Nathan, what are we going to be talking about next time? On next week's episode, we're going to be talking about Cast a Spell, starring Fred Ward, who unfortunately passed away recently. So we're going to be doing a couple Fred Ward movies next week. Yep. It's going to be a Fred Ward week. Mm -hmm. And uh, which, uh, but yeah, if you do have any other thoughts, opinions about this movie or any other movies that we talked about, please email us at drive in double feature podcast at gmail.com. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at DIDF pod. And hey, if you feel like giving, dropping us a little bit of money, we do have a Patreon over at patreon.com slash drive in double feature podcast. Um, no exclusive content at this time, but hey, if there's a demand for it, 
we'll definitely be putting some out there. We're just trying to get a feel if, if, if there's any interest at this time. But, yeah. But if not, you know, we're always going to be here podcasting and having a good time. But until next time. Until next time. Thank you.